All right, what's up everyone? Welcome back to Structure Free Learning. And in this video, we're gonna talk about shear flow again for built up shapes and do an example problem to determine nail spacing of a wooden cross section. But before we do that, we'll talk a little bit about shear flow. And the thing you wanna do when we talk about shear flow is remember the shear flow formula first, which involved this little Q is equal to the internal shear on the beam. So this would be the shear that we get from internal shear diagram of a beam structure. This first moment of area, which might be the most difficult thing to calculate, is a first moment of area associated with the location on the cross section that you want to compute. And we'll talk about that. That's probably the most challenging part. And this moment, uh, this area moment of inertia, which is for the entire cross section. Now the units of this Q, this little Q shear flow is force per length, which, you know, something like Newtons per millimeter or pounds per inch depending on where you are or what country or things you're operating in. In any case, this shear flow is really useful in built up shapes, especially when you want to connect a bunch of different cross-sectional elements together. And, and when you want to determine how many nails you need to make sure that this whole thing acts together, this entire beam cross-section, or or let's say uh, the glue, the strength of the glue you need to bond the different layers together so that your cross section again behaves like a beam together. So you might be wondering like, what do these connections look like? So, hey, I got some pictures right here. I've got here on the top are pictures of wood cross sections used in timber construction. I don't know if you can see the different layers here for this. These have different layers of, let's say like two by fours or, or one by ones or something, just pieces of material connected together. And in this case, these things are all glued and I don't, they, they're all layered and they take all these pieces of wood, glue them together so that the moment of inertia is a lot stronger and you have this deeper beam without needing a, you know, a piece of wood that's all single cross section, right? You don't need to find a giant two by 12. You could just make it, right? And here, this is an I-beam, and, and here in this I-beam, it's glued over here and here, and you take essentially what might be like a two by one or a two by four, and then have a groove on each, and then add this oriented strand board, this OSB, which is really just a bunch of wood fibers glued together. And, and it's able to make a, a strong beam out of cheap material. It could be more cost effective. The shear flow is useful, just, taking a bunch of different materials, putting it together so that you have a beam that is either stronger or stiffer than what, what it is that you could get out of a solid piece of wood, which is typically much more expensive. And then here, what I have down here are different cross sections for here, this is a carbon fiber beam. This is out of carbon fiber, CFRP. And it's got different layers. You know, it's got, it's got layers too, because it's basically layers of carbon fabric that are glued together using some sort of epoxy or another polymer. And then here I've got this aluminum beam that has, that is made by, with an aluminum plate in the middle for the web. And then four angle shapes or four L shapes all riveted or bolted together. And that's pretty cool because, you know, that new, F-150 is made of aluminum as well and all those bolts are riveted because you can't weld aluminum. In any case, you can see the applications for designing the spacing of these connectors or the strength of the glue to hold pieces of material together so that you have a more cost-effective cross-section and something that may be stronger and stiffer than a solid piece, right? All right. So one of the most basic problems associated with shear flow is that you're given, let's say the beam geometry in terms of length, and you have the loading of the beam, and you're even given the strength of the bolt or the nail or the glue. A lot of times what you're asked to do is find the spacing of the connectors 
that you need. Or in the case of the glue, it would be maybe like the strength of the glue that you need. Or, you know, how much glue. Ah, with the glue, that might be a little bit trickier. But the spacing of the connector so that you know how many bolts or nails you're going to need to make sure this beam acts like a beam. The other way that this problem is set up is that you're given the strength of the connectors, the beam geometry and the strength, and sometimes they ask you to find the loading. What's the maximum loading that can be applied to this structure? And that's a very common, that's an important question as well, because a lot of times things fail at connections. Oh, let's go ahead and just start the example problem. So let's say in my example problem, the way that the example problem will work. So for this example problem, I'm gonna look at a problem where I de I'm designing the, the spacing of some nails. I am gonna be given a simply supported beam that has a uniformly distributed load. So we'll go with the simple loading in this case so that this is a first example. And we know that the allowable shear force on a wood screw, 650 newtons. What I would like to do is find the minimum required spacing of the nails or the screws. And here is what my cross section and my beam look like. So in 3D, my simply supported beam would look something like this. Let's see if I can draw. We'll say we have like an I-shaped cross section. All right, that's as good as it's gonna get for me in this 3D looking I-shaped cross section. I will say that it is simply supported at the end. So if you can imagine, we'll say that there's a pin support on this side. Oh, I know it's a large structure. Technically it should be supported right at the center, but we will just put a pin support here. You get the idea and a roller down here, bam. And this thing, this I-shaped cross section is built up. So it's got a bunch of nails, right? So here in gray, it's got nails connecting these plates, these three plates together to make an i shape. And we'll say the nails go right on top, right here, or screws, the wood screws go on top. And there's also wood screws the same on the bottom as well. And what we're trying to do is find the spacing of these screws. And the cross section looks like this. So it's 150 millimeters for the web, 30 millimeter thick flanges. And let's see, the width of this thing is 100 millimeters. And the width of the web here is 25 millimeters. And there's a uniformly distributed load. Oh, that's gonna get crazy here, but it's a uniformly distributed load, which I will just draw. It's a line load that looks like this. And hopefully this drawing is not getting too convoluted. But here, bam, this is a uniformly distributed load. That means it's uniform or constant all the way across. And this thing is two kilonewtons per meter. All right. So let's say I'm doing this problem. I look at it, it's on the final and I'm like, oh frick, I have no idea how to do this problem. I've never even heard the terms before. And you know, one of the things I would do is because this whole class has been, or this whole topic of mechanics and materials about taking internal loading and converting it to some sort of stress or transforming it into something else. I would look at this thing and say, hey, you know, when I got a beam and I've got some loading on it, I should at least try to draw the shear and maybe the moment diagram because those are the internal loads that I need to convert into something else so that I can design this beam or figure out something or solve the problem. So the first thing I would do is, you know, do my statics. And none of this is stuff that you learn you learn in mechanics. This is all stuff you would have learned in the prerequisite for mechanics. And that would be just calculate the reactions, draw the shear moment diagram. And I'm gonna do this fast because this is a, a simply supported beam and it's not a big deal. If you feel like you need practice on shear moment diagrams, this is probably one of the first places you wanna start and you wanna go ahead and practice that on your own. And in this case, I just need the shear diagram because the question only asks for the spacing uh, of, the, of the screws and those screws are associated with shear flow and shear flow is associated only with the internal shear loading. So here it is. Here is what my beam looks like if I draw it with just stick figures. And because the loading and the geometry of the beam are symmetrical, I know that the, re and also the reactions or the external reactions here are also everything. The loading, the external reactions and the geometry of this beam are symmetrical. That means I know that the, re 
that my reactions are going to be the same or equivalent. So that means each one, let's see, the resultant is 2 times 3, which is 6 kilonewtons. We'll have a 3 kilonewton reaction. And then I can go ahead and draw my shear diagram, vertical lines at the discontinuities. Bam. Boom, right here, here's my shear, kilonewtons. And let's see, I go up three kilonewtons and across. So this is, let's see, up three, linear, because I have a uniformly distributed load. And going left to right, bam, there's my shear diagram, plus three here minus three here and my maximum shear is going to be at the support so those or that's the region i'm interested in the length of the beam if my connectors fail or if my beam fails in shear it's likely to happen at or near the supports all right so there's my max shear so v in this case for this problem v is equal to three kilonewtons all right good so i've finished my statics and now I want to apply the basic design relationship for one of these nails or screws which are going through my board. They are going through like this. They are coming in from the bottom and from the top and connecting those boards together so that I can have an eye shape. And and in order for us to look at this, you know, we have to understand the basic design relationship that's applied. And so uh, in order to do that, I, I want to draw, if you will, the web or half of the web of this beam and focus on one nail, okay, or one screw. And so if I look, I'll just call this three and I'll call this the BDR. And if I look at one nail, of this cross section. So if I could uncover one of that top flange board, and if I drew this one little space right here. So if you can imagine, I've taken off the top flange, and what you see here is or one single screw like this into the top of the board. And it continues here and it's bam, sharp. And it's connecting that top board to the web board. This screw is responsible for a certain or connecting a certain region of the beam, just like a zone defense. You know, you're responsible for a certain area, right? And so this is responsible, if you will, halfway to the next nail and halfway to the other nail. So if I go back up here real fast, like this screw right here, if that's the one I drew, this one is responsible for halfway and halfway or in between the other connector. So it's in responsible for connecting that zone, right? That zone of the beam together or that flange to the web. And that distance, assuming everything is, you know, uniformly spaced and everything, that distance for this problem would be halfway to each, and in this case, if everything is spaced the same distance, each of these would be S over two, S over two. So the area or the length of responsibility is actually this full length S. The spacing of the screw is, the, is that region of responsibility. The force that gets applied on one of the screws, which I will just boom, go like this right here, is related to the shear flow between the layers. And here, this is this Q right here. There's that shear flow. And that applied force is equal to the shear flow, which was in units of newtons per meter or newtons per millimeter or force per length. And this is a flow, right? So a force per length, this Q. And in order to turn this into a force, I've got to multiply it by the spacing or really the length of responsibility of my connector is, is another way of putting it. And I'm going to add also right here the number of shear planes because if I have because sometimes that shear flow or that, you know, that zone is that zone or that area of responsibility of the connector has more than one shear plane. Like in this case here, we're looking at a problem that has only a single shear plane right here and then a single shear plane right here. But it depends on the area that you select for that capital Q, that first moment of area. And we'll talk about that in a second. 
So here, this is my force applied and my basic design relationship that this says is this force applied on the, on the connector or the screw here has to be less than or equal to whatever is allowed. And if you can look at the mechanics model for this, for a nail, this is a single lap shear connection. And we're gonna, the way we're gonna look at this nail is like a single lap shear connection. And we're gonna use an, technically what we do is we cut it and we use an average shear stress across that area. But nonetheless, if you can understand this part, this basic design relationship, you're, you're pretty much home. You know what I'm saying? It's pretty crazy. All right, so here for the shear flow, I'm just gonna substitute for that shear flow, this V Q over I times S over the number of shear planes. And this number of shear planes, again, is related to this capital Q that we choose for this problem. This F allow, in this case, would be 650 newtons. So let's see, what do we know and what do we not know? We know capital V, yes. We're trying to figure out this spacing, all right? And this number of shear planes is dependent on this first moment of area. And then we can calculate the moment of inertia. It's just of an I-shaped cross-section. So what we're really looking at are geometric properties next. So one, two, three, four geometric props. And in particular, I'm talking about Q. And in particular, I'm talking about the moment of inertia and this first moment of area, capital Q. All right, so to do that, let's talk, let's go ahead and calculate the moment of inertia of this cross section, which is this thing right here. I'm gonna make a copy of this and bring it down. Oh yeah, there it is. And I, you know, this is a symmetrical cross section. So I know that the centroid, the geometric centroid is right in the middle. Boom, just to calculate the moment of inertia about the horizontal axis here, or the neutral axis in this case, I can take, let's see, the, I can do a shortcut and take the big box, if you will, right here which is 1 12th the base 100 millimeters times the height, which is 150 plus 30 plus 30, so 210 millimeters cubed, minus the voids, which is this orange area and this orange area. And I can subtract the voids in this problem because the centroid of the voids is also on the centroid of my larger or from my entire cross section. So this, let's see, there's two of these voids and I'm gonna have 1 12th, one of these rectangles. So this is 100 minus 25, that's 75. So this, this, the, the to this distance right here is 37 and a half millimeters. So I have 37.5 millimeters times the height, which is 150 millimeters cubed. And now if I go ahead and I calculate this thing, the moment of inertia is 56.081 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth. So there is my moment of inertia about the horizontal axis. Now for my first moment of area, Ah, this is the challenge usually with shear flow. So here, when I calculate capital Q, I have to make sure, or in its essence, I'm wanting to calculate the shear flow or shear stress in a way where my connectors are, okay? So that's one thing, that's one thing to start. I have to look at the location where my connectors are or, or where the elements of my cross section are being connected. So that would be here and here. Okay, but I'm not gonna put a red line here. Now one choice, I could just choose this point right here and I have to, when I calculate my capital Q, that equation for capital Q is the sum of A prime times Y bar prime. And A prime, or this area, or for my first moment of area, is all the area above or below where I want to calculate my shear flow in this case. So if, if I chose this as my only shear plane, then I would have this as my area. This would be A prime. And the and Y bar prime is the distance, I'll do this in purple, is the distance from the centroid of this area to the, 
the neutral axis, or I should say, it's the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of a prime. This is this y bar prime. And so if I chose this area right here, as I know that I'm interested in the connection, I choose all the area above, then this, in this case, this a prime is equal to 100 times 30 millimeters, which is 3,000 millimeters squared, and y bar prime, so my y bar prime is the distance from the neutral axis to the center of this, which is 105 millimeters minus 15 millimeters, which takes me to 90 millimeters. And so for this case, my capital Q would be 3,000 millimeters squared times 90 millimeters, which is equal to 270,000 millimeters cubed, which I could also write as 0.27 zero times 10 to the six millimeters cubed. All right, so that's one way. And, and in this case right here, this is the first moment of area associated this with this one shear plane. So based on my selection here, I've only gone with one shear plane. Now check this out. I could, alternatively, I could look at this cross section and say, hey, I wanna solve it considering both shear planes both of these connectance, connections. And let me do this again. So if that were the case, I could do, again, everything above or below, but I've got to have some boundaries. It's like I can only go from shear plane to shear plane, if you will, right here. So I could choose as one possibility, and this drawing is gonna get messy, but I will choose this in orange here. I have, I could choose this area as potentially my A prime. So let's say I did, okay, so I have this A prime. So I'm choosing Q, this alternative Q with this A prime, and this A prime times Y bar prime. And I've got a single element this time. It's associated with two shear planes. And in this case here, I've got, let's say, boom to boom right there. And this area is 25 millimeters by 150 millimeters. But the centroid of this bad boy is right here. It's right on the neutral axis. The centroid of this orange area is right on the neutral axis. So. Oh snap, right? That's that's just that's not going to work for us because look, when I look for y bar prime, the way that this is defined is the distance from the neutral axis to the center of the element. And in this case, that's stinking zero, which is equal to zero. And that would say capital Q is zero, which means the shear flow is zero, which means hey, I don't need any nails to make this thing work together, which makes absolutely no sense, right? Oi. Right? If you have a bo three boards and you have no nails, you don't have a beam, son. You just got three boards. <laughs> All right. So that's why that's just that's just not right. And that's not going to work for us. So this anytime you get the first moment of area equal to zero, you know there's something wrong, right? So the other choice that I could have is everything, if you will, beyond beyond the the shear planes. And that would mean that I would choose this area here, this blue area again. So I'll shade again, even darker. And I would choose the bottom here. And when I calculate this capital Q, the sum of A prime times Y bar prime, when I do this, I would have, ah, this area here we already know is 3000 millimeters squared. So I'll just write it is 100 millimeters times 30 millimeters, and the distance from the neutral axis to the center of this element, which is right there, that we found was 90 millimeters. And if I add the other term, this area down here, this area is the same, it's also 100 millimeters times 30 millimeters, and the distance from the neutral axis to the center here is also 90 millimeters, which would just give me double this thing right here, which would be 540,000 millimeters cubed. And that would be my first mode of area. And remember, this thing is associated with two shear planes. It was our choice. 
All right, so now I definitely feel like I'm balling because, damn, you know, I count all the geometric properties. I got the internal shear force. I, I even have an understanding of the number of shear planes that are associated with the way I'm going to solve it. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate for the spacing here, this S. So let's see. Let's say I take the first way that I calculated this uh, uh, first moment of area and the one associated with one shear plane. So for the one shear plane area, you know, when I go ahead and I plug and chug numbers, let's see, that shear force here in this relationship was three kilonewtons. That first moment of area was 0 0.270 times 10 to the six millimeters cubed. The moment of inertia was 56.081 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth. And for this first moment of area, I had one shear plane, less than or equal to 650 newtons which I could convert into kilonewtons. And this thing is just 0.65 kilonewtons. And when I, you know, look at how convenient this is. The 10 to the six cancels out millimeters cubed per millimeter. You know, I, I know that this kilonewton and that kilonewton is gonna cancel out. I'm gonna be left here, boom, that millimeters cubed. I'm just gonna be left with millimeters, which makes sense for this spacing. And when I solve this, I should get a spacing that's required is less than or equal to 45 millimeters. Wow, look at how nice that number turned out. So this is with one shear plane. And look, and you probably wanna know, hey, does it work with that two shear plane thing? And you know, and I know it's gonna work because I had this 540,000 and this bottom number is gonna become two shear planes. So here, if I do this again, for the two shear plane case, again, the same internal shear force, three kilonewtons, that first moment of area this time was 0 0.540 times 10 to the six millimeters cubed divided by the moment of inertia, 56.081 times 10 to the six millimeters to the fourth times S divided by this time two shear planes less than or equal to 0.65 kilonewtons again. And here you can see already when I divide this 0.54 by two, I'm gonna get the exact same numbers as that first case. And I would get that the spacing required has to be less than or equal to 45 millimeters. And if I were designing this and trying to stay within my labels, I may choose something like 40 millimeter spacing just to make sure I have a little bit of safety, right? All right, I hope this was a useful introduction to shear flow for built-up shape. Structure free!